thrilled to have you here. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our uh, session. We are recording this today so that we can make it available to those who weren't able to make it. Uh, and we're gonna, of course, kick off with quick introductions. I'll start, I'll hand it over to Christine to introduce herself, but I do wanna acknowledge our two colleagues, David, Daniel, and Liz Lewis, who are on the back end helping our uh, conversation run smoothly today. So thanks to Liz and David for being here and being part of the MBA for Executives Admissions team. My name is Joanne Legler. I'm the Director of Admissions for the MBA for Executives program. I've been at Yale almost eight years now and been working with this program for the last several years. And I'm lucky enough to be joined by my colleague, Christine Balzano today. Hi, everybody. Glad that you can join us, even if you are coming to us from Mexico. Um, hi, Christine Balzano, really nice to meet you. Uh, glad to be with you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining me, Christine. It's always great to work with you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and kick off our webinar by uh, wel welcoming you to sunny and warm um, New Haven, Connecticut, which is where Yale University and the School of Management is located. Uh, it does not look like this every day <laughs> of every year. In fact, it's probably quite different today, um, but the sun is shining. And I hope as conditions continue to improve, hopefully through the pandemic this year, we'll be able to invite you to our lovely campus one of these days. For now, we're going to go ahead and go through uh, our presentations so that you have a better sense of what we're uh, eager to hear more from you about in terms of our application, give you some tips to get you started along the way. Uh, if you decide that you'd like to ask us a question today, and I hope that you will, I will encourage you to use the Q&A feature rather than the chat feature. That's uh, First of all, it makes it a little easier for us to potentially answer your questions on the back end, and Liz and David will help us to do that. Uh, and then we'll also use that feature towards the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A feature at any time. We will get to those questions live towards the end of our time together today. But again, welcome to Yale. Uh, this picture is of Sterling Memorial Library, which is one of the more beautiful places on campus. And even though it's not at the School of Management, it does give you a nice window, literally, into what it looks like in some of our historic buildings on our very historic old campus. Uh, Yale University is quite historic and home to many Nobel Prize winners, uh, Supreme Court justices, US presidents and vice presidents, Academy Award winners, Golden Globe Award winners. We are lucky to be surrounded um, by everything that Yale has to offer from a historical perspective. And hopefully you can sort of think about yourself potentially studying in this space, even though you're not a student in this library, you are a student at SOM, which means you're a student at Yale. And all of these wonderful facilities and resources are available to you at any time. So while the rest of Yale is quite historic and quite old, by contrast, the School of Management is quite modern and quite new. We were founded back in the 1970s, really as an MPPM program, and then morphed into an MBA program. And I can promise you the building did not look like this back in 1976. So we are fortunate to have this really great, modern, open, transparent space that very much reflects our feelings about the transparency of business, and so hopefully we'll be able to welcome you into this building as a visitor in the near future, or perhaps as a student in uh, either a few months or a few years, depending on where you may be on your EMBA journey. This is a photo from the second floor. You can see our library off to the right, our courtyard off to the left. And as you can see, it is quite glass oriented, uh, which does make it a bit of a challenge to monitor in terms of temperature inside sometimes of the year. In terms of what we're gonna be doing today, we're gonna to give a brief overview of our mission, our community, what it means to be a student at Yale SOM, but then spend the bulk of our time on the admissions process. We'll go over each component of the application and give you some tips and tricks to consider, and then give you some things to think about in terms of your own next steps on your EMBA journey. If you are interested in learning more about our program, I highly recommend going back to any of our previously recorded webinars. Our information sessions do give a much more detailed overview of the program itself, or join us this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern time for an information session. Um, I'll be there with my colleague, David, and we're happy to talk to you and answer your questions about the program. We'll go into much more detail about our areas of focus, schedule, things like that. So join us on Saturday if you can, or join us uh, in February on the 12th, we'll do the same thing. So that's our agenda for today. And as we start almost every presentation, I'll start with our mission. Our mission at the Yale School of Management is to educate leaders for business and society. It is our founding mission. So it is always what we've, <clears throat> excuse me, thought about. It's how we operate. And it really drives both the day-to-day -day decisions that we make at the School of Management, as well as the long-term and strategic vision of who we are as an institution and who we want to continue to be. Everybody at SOM, students, faculty, staff can essentially rattle off this mission pretty easily. Like I said, it really drives what we do and who we are. 
And we really want to educate leaders who are broad-minded thinkers, who are thinking both about the problems that face us in business today, but have the foresight to think about what problems may crop up tomorrow, and are always thinking about both of these sort of sides of the same coin, business and society. We have a dean who used to say that the most important words here are the small ones. Two, which really indicates our intentionality. Uh, four, um, which really indicates who we're, we're sort of looking for, leaders who are thinking about things uh, in the future, and the and part. And it is impossible to separate these two things. And business cannot solve problems without a societal lens. And societal problems can't be solved without business. And so we really are truly looking for those students who are seeing both sides of how every decision that they make as a leader is going to impact both the day-to-day -day of what they do in their organizations and the larger or broader society. Could be their organization, could be their team, could be their state or city, or even more broadly globally as well. We are a community of purpose, we are a community on purpose. And when we talk about that, we talk very intentionally about the community we intend to bring in year over year to the MBA for Executives program. For me, it's a community that is rooted in students who are engaged, engaging. It is a very serious thing to think about what we do for a living here and bringing in this cohort every year. But we also manage to have some fun. Obviously, many of these pictures are taken pre-pandemic, pre um, but we do offer opportunities for students to network and to cohort and to get to know each other. Um, and that could be a small group here in Evans Hall, you know, solving a problem uh, for a particular class. It could be a larger group thinking about how they are going to come together for an entrepreneurial opportunity. It involves our alumni. Uh, our alumni community is incredibly engaged. And here in this photo, you'll see them coming back to campus often to sit in on panels, uh, to mentor our students. Um, our students, I think, are also inspired by each other. They are inspiring to me personally, and I think to each other as well. Uh, we're truly looking to bring together those students who are looking to solve the really big problems in the classroom, outside the classroom, coming together in a way that creates bonds that really do last a lifetime. And sometimes those bonds are revisited professionally as students are looking for new opportunities or personally, when maybe they're moving to a new city or a state or have a question about a kid's school or I've definitely had students tell us stories about connecting with some of the physicians in our program when they are curious about a healthcare issue that they or a family member might be facing. Um, for us, this is really the root of what we think makes SOM so special, our small and tight-knit community. This last photo here is a great photo, I think, of the people who make up our community. Both our incoming students, this is uh, members of the class of 2023, who started our program this past July, along with our assistant dean, Wendy Song on the left and smack in the middle, our dean, Kerwin Charles. Uh, so this is really a great representation of a bit about who makes up our special community. So who are we looking for? Who are we looking for to join this community? Well, first and foremost, this is an executive MBA program. That means we're looking for folks with experience in solving those tough, uh, tough problems in their organizations or their cities or towns. We're looking for folks who have had the opportunity to elevate in terms of their responsibility and leadership at work and experience solving those difficult uh, issues. Somebody with demonstrated career evolution. So somebody who's a great fit for the MBA for executives is probably not in their very first job still out of college, but instead is moving along a path or has already achieved a goal of leadership that demonstrates an evolution from the first college or post-college job that they had uh, up until now, where they've either been tapped or have the potential to be tapped for eventual leadership in their organizations and somebody who's looking for that acceleration. So doing an MBA program means that that path might accelerate a little bit faster than it might have without the MBA. And people who are ready and at the point in their career where they can take advantage and access the amazing resources that the School of Management and Yale University in general has to offer them. So we really talk a lot about readiness. Are you ready to take this next step? And are those in your life ready to support you through that journey? To put a slightly finer point on it, we'd like to introduce you to the class of 2023, although this looks like a slightly chaotic picture. Um, what we do when this class begins every year, and we were lucky enough, by the way, to start this past cohort in person uh, and on campus and on time. So the entire class of 2023 is somewhere in this picture. Uh, as you can see, they are all masked up and that continues to be a health and safety consideration at this moment as well. In any case, uh, the number of students in this class was 76. We aim for a cohort of about 75 students each year. 
with an average of 14 years of work experience, nearly half of our class was women, really excited about that gender representation. About 50% have already achieved what we would consider to be an advanced degree. Um, they also represent 14 citizenships um, and they are about 37 years of age. More information, uh, detailed information about our class profile can of course be found on our website. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Christine and she's gonna walk us through the bulk of the components of the application process and then a few of the components of the application requirements and then I'll come back in uh, towards the end. But Christine, thank you for taking on the line share of our presentation today. Thank you, Duran. Um, so we're going to dive right in with the admissions process, which uh, is pretty straightforward. We don't try to make it complicated or confusing or, or, or you know, make it overly stressful. We know it's time consuming, especially for busy folks who are working. So we try to make it as straightforward as possible. So this is our opportunity to get to know our students from both a personal and professional standpoint. Each step of the process is important to us. So you'd submit your application by the round deadline that you're interested in applying for, which hopefully you already know this, but our next round uh, coming up is January 31st. Um, the ultimately from there goes to admissions committee review where we will read your application. Each of us will read your application, uh, make our comments and then come together as a committee to discuss whether we'd like to invite you to interview. You are then invited to interview. Uh, if you're given that opportunity and you participate in our interview day. Uh, and then from there, you go again to an admissions committee review, and then we make our final decision through that. So I'll talk a little bit more about the process in depth uh, and the components of it uh, in this next slide, as well as then through the, the subsequent slides. So as you'll see here, we've already passed our first deadline. Like I mentioned, our next one is coming up January 31st, and we do have a third round that's March 30th of 2022. So keep those dates in mind and definitely the key piece to be thinking about ahead of those deadlines is what needs to happen in order to meet each of those. So you'll see this bulleted list here, including all of the components of the application. I'll dive in a a little bit more in depth to each of these pieces. Um, but in particular, the um, resume, essays, uh, letters of recommendation, we need a test score, your transcripts, employer approval, application fee, and then that inter inter invitation, excuse me, to interview are all part of the pro process. We are not on rolling admission, so you definitely want to include um, that, you know, those deadlines in your diary and make sure that you're meeting those timelines and, and getting those in on time. So let's first dive into uh, the resume, as that's our first bullet there. Um, and I want to I want to make a note here um, that's really important to think about. That there are many different types of resumes out there for the different types of work you do. We've seen uh, you know physician resumes that are very you know lots of of posters and reading and 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 you know publishing experience and things like that. There are uh, consulting resumes that have a lot of project work. We want you to represent yourself the best way you think. It um, really shows who you are and what you've done. However, we really do want to see um, the trajectory of what you've done. And a business school resume, an application to business school resume, is different than a professional resume. So those, that's a really key feature to think about. We'd like that to be one to two pages in length. Of course, that very much depends on how much work you've done. And we have certainly seen longer resumes. But we want you to include all of your work experience. Um, don't uh, fall into the trap that a few people have fallen into before of only including those pieces that are relevant to the area of focus you're interested in or relevant to the specific career path you see yourself going into and or have been in. We want to see everything to understand your pathway, the trajectory, the, the um, graduated progression of your experience and, and the impact you've had. It's important within a business school resume to give us you know, a highlight of your greatest hits, if you will, of the measurable outcomes, the impact that you've been able to have in your organization, the value you've been able to add. So it, it, a common trap is to upload something you might have already had. I would recommend against that unless it's really up to date and really does give that sense of a curated list that's giving us a sense of your impact. So consider it as an application resume versus a job uh, resume. So uh, those are kind of a couple of features I think to think about. Uh, let's move on next uh, to our areas of focus. This is a big piece, and I know Joanne mentioned our upcoming information session where we'll dig more deeply into these areas and what each of them might mean for a different person. But the, the basic idea um, within each of these is that 
throughout the application, we want to get a little bit of a sense of where you might fit, where you might connect with one of our areas of focus. So these are visual representations of what might be stereotypes, so asset management, healthcare, and sustainability. 25% um, of our curriculum will be in your area of focus, so that, and that will be in your second year. So it's important for us to get an understanding of your um, demonstrated commitment within one of these three areas. Now, that can be defined in different ways. Um, and, you know, part of that, really, we do ask for you to show a little bit of an evolution in your career that's allowed you to either have several touch points or you're squarely within a certain space um, and that you're, the direction of your work is completely going within that space, whether it's asset management, healthcare, or sustainability. We want to have a clear, we want to be we want you to be clear about the content of those classes you will take in that second year and how those might relate and align with your goals. So the question we ask on the asset on the application, excuse me, is to to which area of focus are you applying and why have you selected this area of focus essentially. So that's really for us to get a sense of where your career hits. In some cases, it can be quite obvious. In some cases, it's not. So I'll dig a little bit more deeply. For asset management, for example, you might think that that, you know, fall squarely with those who might serve in the financial industry, maybe within wealth management, but we also see a broader set coming to us that are applying. So assets um, themselves are evolving as, as there are different classes, art as an asset, property as an asset. So we want to understand your functional role a little bit more, the leadership experience you have. That might mean that you're working in private equity, or it might mean that you're working for a fintech or venture capital, or you know, you're a traditional portfolio manager, or you might work in regulatory the regulatory sector or risk. So it, for us, it's an understanding of what you're currently doing within that space and where your career is going to continue to go. And the real important part is that that coursework really makes sense for, you know, what you want to be accomplishing professionally. The next area of focus is healthcare. Again, that might seem a little bit like it's, you know, especially with that photo, might seem a little bit like we're looking for practitioners. Now, the genesis of our program would have been around that. That was our, you know, our founding of the uh, MBA for Executives program was as a healthcare focused program, and that was our initial area of focus. But we've evolved significantly since that time. And so that might include biotech or big pharma or, um, you know, life sciences or medical devices, health equity, health population. So it really can run the gamut of a number of things. Um, and really, again, it's we look to you to help us understand where your work fits in with that area of focus. Um, and finally, sustainability, which probably tends to be the broadest of our areas of focus, um, partly because many more companies are becoming aware of environmental impact uh, that the organization might have and wanting to develop more sustainable either business practices or literally environmental practices. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that your job title might be director of sustainability or you know corporate social responsibility, though we certainly see people with that. Um, but it, 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 we do have to have a sense that your work is squarely within sustainability, within that space in some capacity. That does, however, sometimes cross um, typically energy, oil, and gas, of course, if you're more traditional, fitting with this image here, but then we've had consumer goods and supply chain, nonprofit, government, policy. So it really can run the gamut of a number of different ways that that can come through. So that question, we really wanna understand where you see yourself fitting within that area of focus. So continuing on with the other section of the application essays, this, that particular one I mentioned, it's only 250, 150 to 250 words. These are our longer essays, 500 word maximums. You'll see the questions there, um, but they're an important piece of the application for us as a way to get to know you. You've pr you'll provide all of those sort of statistical pieces of information with your grades and your test scores and your you know, resume showing your years of experience. This is a chance for us to see what's behind all of that data and really understand who you are. So this first question, we're not trying to make it complicated. We really do just want to get to know you. It's straightforward on purpose. You know, we're really eager to understand your need and desire for an MBA, you know, how you see that coming together within the Yale SOM program, in particularly this format, the executive format, uh, and that understanding of your area of focus. Again, you'll, address, you'll have addressed that in the shorter question, but sometimes a little bit more here can give context to the kind of work you're doing and the kind of work you see yourself continuing to do either within your organization or as you move through your career. Um, and we really do want to understand why Yale is the best place for you to do this. Um, we, we are not naive enough to think that you're only going to apply to Yale. We'd love that if that were the case, but you know, we know that you're going to consider other schools. 
do not recycle an essay from another school for Yale because we're a different type of program as Joanne mentioned. And we really wanna understand if you fit for our program, it's a big piece of the equation for us. So really understanding your future goals, your motivations, where you see yourself fitting in with our community is an important part of this process. Um, the second essay, we really wanna to get to know a little bit more about you, what you're passionate about. So we ask you to cite a statistic that you find shocking and how as a leader for business and society, you will address that challenge. So again, this can be anything you want to address. Sometimes that might manifest itself in something more connected to your career as the rest of the application I've spoken about, but it could be absolutely something else. And certainly we do have plenty of people that are using things that are outside of their career experience. Sometimes it's personal interest, sometimes it's a board that you might sit on, and that's an organization that you're really passionate about. I think the most important tip with any of these questions is make sure you answer the question. And I cannot emphasize, emphasize that enough. It, with each round of reading applications over my too many years to, to number uh, of business school admissions experience, when you get to the end of the essay and you are not sure what question the person is answering, it's not ideal. So the best probably litmus test for that is to send that essay off to one of your friends who does not know this question and ask them, what do you think what the question was that I was trying to answer. And then you'll really understand whether you've hit enough of the points or if you're there at least in the ballpark of what, what we're looking for. So it's a really important piece of the equation. Okay, so the next piece of our application, I'll be mindful of time. Okay, employer approval. This is a pretty straightforward piece. I, I quickly want to mention the sort of photo in the background. That student, Desio, um, was I think a 2019 or 2020, I can't remember, uh, class and uh, class of 2020. And that this particular image is from our investor class, which is part of our uh, integrated core curriculum. Uh, this one taught by Rodrigo Canales, and he is working on a tower project. Um, you can see he's got some spaghetti there. I'm not sure what the rest of his team is doing in the back there, maybe social loafing, but you know, hey, if you want to have an opportunity to get involved uh, with Yale, you're going to have to get some employer approval, and you're going to have to do that through this application process. As part of the application, you simply have to name the person or people that would be giving that approval, um, and ultimately, if you're invited to interview, that is when an email would be generated generated to that person to offer that formal appro approval. This is a time consuming program. It's every other weekend for 22 consecutive month, months. And then you've got those four residential weeks, you will be out of the office. So it's important to have that stakeholder commitment and really have that upfront so that there is no question later, right? Once you get invited to interview, that is a required piece in order to be able to interview is getting that approval. So if you haven't already, you should start talking to the people that the constituents that are involved in this, in this decision-making, whether that's your supervisor or HR, whoever that might be, we don't have a specific person we require it to be, we definitely require that as part of the interview. Um, and just a side note for anyone who's self-employed or an entrepreneur, that is also required, but you can list yourself. So if you have any question about that, certainly let us know and we can we can help guide you through that if, if you need some assistance on that. Um, okay, so Another piece of the professional equation is these letters of recommendation. It may in fact also be the person who's giving you approval. As part of our process, we ask for two letters of recommendation. And in an ideal world, this is gonna be at at least one of these is going to be from your current supervisor or supervisors, um, and preferably, you know, from a previous supervisor, if that's possible. Um, you know, we want someone who can speak to your strengths, your character, your performance, your potential to continue to do well, both within your organization and just academically in this kind of an environment, um, as well as your successes, too. We want, really want to get a sense of where they see your impact having come in within your organization and in the role that you're in that they have purview over. Um, Titles are much less critical. Um, you know, we want you to choose those who know you well um, and can tell those great stories about you and the, the impact that you've had within uh, your workplace, within your teams, managing others and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned on the last slide about the employer approval, we definitely you want you to re be requesting this well in advance as well. These are busy professionals, at high levels of leadership who need some time to do this. Um, it needs to be submitted by the application deadline, the same as the rest of your materials. Um, the best way, my tip for this, the best way to approach going about this is arrange a time to sit down and talk to them if you haven't already. Talk through what your goals are, why you see this MBA um, being of value to you, and where you think it will provide value to your organization uh, as well. 
talk through um, some of the key things that you've been able to provide within your role or perhaps provide that um, to them, you know, some through some other means of communication, email or a bulleted list or something like that to jog their memory of some of those uh, stories of impact that you've had, you know, we're all our uh, own worst enemy at trying to remember, remember things. So it's always good to have a little bit of a reminder and give them plenty of time, um, though sometimes too much time is too, too much definitely give them at least four weeks, uh, if possible, to pull that together for you. Um, and I will say, you know, when you're asking busy working professionals from time to time, they might suggest that you write that letter. If that happens, it's time to look for a new recommender. It is not appropriate to be writing your own recommendation. Certainly, you can provide them with some information to jog their memory. But if they're asking you um, to write that because they're too busy to be able to do that, it's time to look for somebody else who might be able to spend that time, give that enthusiasm and energy to helping support your application. Okay, moving on to the next piece of the equation, our test scores. This is probably everyone's least favorite thing to think about and talk about, but it is a required part of our application process. Um, we do ask that you complete either the GMAT, the GRE, or the executive assessment. It is absolutely up to your choice. We do not have a preference. We simply ask that it is a valid test. Um, it is everyone's least favorite thing because we've all had to do tests in the past. We're working professionals in many cases for those applying, as Joanne mentioned earlier, 50% of our students already have advanced degrees. They've probably taken graduate level exams. Unfortunately, we do not waive this for anyone. It is the best way for us to see where you are at this moment in time. It gives us the strongest sense of your capability of stepping into our program with the level of vigor and rigor that is required. Um, we do not get, there are no exceptions to being able to take the exam and we do not have a preference, but the executive assessment is one I would definitely suggest to think about if you are, fall in the camp of people who really don't like tests. Uh, it is much shorter than both the GMAT and GRE. It is three 30-minute sections versus three hour or hour plus sections um, on either of those other two tests. Um, and it was developed in partnership with executive MBA programs to really be a more accurate representation of what skills are needed in the program. There are practice exams and test preparation kinds of questions, gmac.org. Uh, GMAC is the organization that administers that test as well as the GMAT. Um, and there are some practice questions you can do there for free, as well as there are also some resources that you can purchase to help you with that. And our students and alumni have told us that by and large, those resources are the only things that they use to help them prepare. It takes about 15 to 20 hours worth of review and preparation versus sometimes 50 to 75 or more uh, for the GMAT or GRE. Again, uh, we do not have a preference, but we ask that you submit those. You can submit your test, uh, sorry, your self-reported test scores at the time of application. We will ultimately need to have your official test score to verify everything, but to be considered for interview and, and admission on the front end, you are able to submit your own self-reported scores. And you should finish those tests before the deadline so that you have those results um, at the time that you submit. If there's any questions about that, we're certainly happy to answer those like we mentioned in the Q&A, um, but that's one piece that's always, that often trips people up. Uh, okay, on to some other, you know, more academic pieces, the transcripts. So really quick, this photo here is a photo of some of our alumni. On the very far left there is um, Lauren Re Raznick, sorry, I always want to say Raznick. Lauren Resnick Hines. She's class of 2019. She's moderating that panel. She um, served as VP of Corporate Social Responsibility at NBC Universal. And the other folks there in the panel on the far left, well, not far left, next left, um, is Catherine Everett, a 2010 alumna, president of Coastal Radiology in North Carolina. And the woman in the middle there is Donna Leckie of 2016. She's co-founder of Health Venture and Health Haven Hub and managing director of Health Haven Capital. Um, and the gentleman there with the looks like purple tie is Sadina Fall, uh, 2017 alum, uh, founder and managing partner of SMF and Company, an international real estate operating company. And finally, on the far right here um, is Mark Wigder, of also of the class of 2017, founding and managing principal of Greenhouse Property Company. Gives you a little bit of a subset of who we have coming to our program. They do like to come back and share insights. This particular one I think was through uh, leading through challenging times uh, conversation that I think is was particularly helpful, uh, you know, leading up to COVID without really realizing it. Um, so anyway, transcripts, uh, just, you know, as much as, as is important of your test scores, 
we need to understand and get a demonstration of your academic readiness. So undergraduate and graduate records are required for the application, whatever degree granting institution you completed uh, your program at, as well as any programs you might have taken courses that might have transferred elsewhere. So when in doubt, send us every transcript you have. Um, for those that are living outside the US or completed their degrees outside the US, and uh, particularly those in countries where English is not the native language. If your uh, transcript requires translation, that is something you will have to arrange to take care of to send to us already translated. Um, you know, this really, the transcript is a big important piece for us to help us gauge your potential as a learner. It gives us a snapshot of how you've done in the past in an academic environment. Um, as I mentioned with the test scores, an unofficial um, transcript is acceptable at the time of application. We ultimately will need an official. The, the sort of important pieces to think about when you're sending any unofficial documentation related to your academics are that it's got your name on it, that you were rendered a degree and at what time, that, um, uh, that it shows that you, you know, you were enrolled for which terms at which time, um, and that it, 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 if again, if it's not in English, that it, that it gives us some sense of a translation for what your grading system was, and all of that, as well as the individual courses. Okay, uh, I think this might be the last but not least piece before I pass it back over to Joanne, and that's interviews. Uh, I mentioned it a little earlier on, you will um, have to go through the process of having your application read to be considered to be invited to interview. So this is an important piece of the equation. As I mentioned earlier, the application is a chance for us to get to know you a little bit better, to understand who you are, what your interests are, really beyond just your career and the numbers behind your transcripts and your test scores. Um, and the interview is both an opportunity for us to, to, to dig in a little bit more deeply with that, but also for you to get to know us a little more deeply as well. So. Um, as I mentioned, the required piece of the application, or sorry, required piece of the process if you're invited to interview, um, and you will need that employer approval to be able to do that. These are conducted by Yale you know, SOM EMBA staff, like myself or Joanne or our colleagues Liz and David, um, as well as we have group meetings with the faculty advisors for each of the areas of focus. Alumni get involved in the process. Uh, so it's a pretty thorough uh, process with a number of touch points that allow you to get to know different people from different perspectives of the program. Um, you know, this probably goes without saying, but I will tell you this has happened in the past and we, we say it because it happens. Show up on time, make sure you're dressed professionally. And by professionally, I would suggest a suit or a dress if you're a woman, a nice top. Um, we can't see what's going on on the bottom, obviously, but we definitely don't want you showing up in, you know, a golf shirt um, or not having a jacket or, you know, something like that. So again, it probably goes without saying, but you'd be surprised what we've seen over time. Um, and I would highly recommend, because these are virtual at this time, that you test your technology ahead of time, make sure you've got the lighting you want, that you're in a space that's quiet, all of those things. This, you know, this is, business school. It's got the name business in it, so we want you to treat it like a professional business opportunity. So um, we definitely want you to be able to take advantage of the interview as much as possible, but it is also a chance for us to evaluate as well. Um, so, you know, have some intelligent questions prepared as part of this process. We definitely, you know, we'll leave time at the end of the interview to allow you to ask questions. You obviously would ask different questions to an admission staff person than you would to an alum. Um, we, we want you to be digging a little bit beyond what you can already find on our website. So really think about what's important for you to know in this journey for you and your particular goals and path. What, what is gonna be important for you to make this decision and understand if we're the right place. Um, don't waste your interview, do your research. Um, again, goes without saying, but much like answering the essay questions and making sure you answer them, uh, you'd be surprised how many people when asked, you know, what is it about Yale that you really like, struggle to um, answer that in a way that gives me any sense that they have a, a depth of understanding about what makes us a really special and unique place. So seems obvious, but don't, uh, don't let, let that be something that gets uh, tripped over for no reason. Uh, on the bottom of that slide there, we have our interview dates upcoming. So for this deadline of January 31st, those interview dates would be Friday and Saturday, February 25th and 26th. And for our March 30th uh, deadline, the uh, interview dates would be April 22nd and 23rd. So if you're thinking about us in either of those deadlines, maybe you might wanna mark those days as days you might wanna keep aside uh, so that should you be invited to interview, you have the capability to spend a few hours with us on those days. Uh, I am going to turn it over to Joanne because I'm sure you're sick of listening to me uh, and let her take it from here. 
Excellent. Well done, Christine. Thank you so much for walking us through all of the components of our application. I'm gonna tackle the very last one before I do so. I just wanna offer a reminder that if you do have any questions that you'd like for Christine or I to tackle in the remaining time that we have, which we have plenty of it, um, you know, happy to answer those questions uh, live and in person right now. So don't hesitate, uh, go ahead and, and let us know what's on your mind. Uh, one of the optional components of the application is to provide us with any additional information that didn't quite fit somewhere nicely and squarely within the application itself. Uh, perhaps that's just an explanation of something that you might have going on at work, uh, the reason why you might not have chosen one recommender uh, like your supervisor, which is sort of typical for us. So I will encourage you to consider about whether you want to use the opportunity of what sort of is called the optional essay. We call it additional information um, to provide us with that. I don't have to use this. And in fact, we really encourage you not to unless there's a really good reason to do so. Um, but some examples that I've uh, offered up here are to clarify an academic history. So if you didn't do so hot in your undergraduate uh, or you would like to explain a particular semester or year, this is a perfect time to do that. If, like I mentioned, you decide not to use your most current supervisor as one of your recommenders, it's a great opportunity to explain that choice here. If your role has changed in any way, if you have moved on, if you, uh, you know, only recently took a new job, if there's something that we might look at on a resume that cause us to ask a few questions about why that move was made, uh, go ahead and, and put that information here. Anything else that you feel is significant that you'd like us to know more about, you can use the additional information section of the application. I'd say what it is not for is to write another essay. Perhaps you just really like the essay that you wrote for some other school. This is not that opportunity. It's not your opportunity to reiterate your interest in our program. We give you that opportunity to do so in a succinct way in the essay portion of the application. So. Uh, you know, as much as we are excited about your enthusiasm for the program, if offered the opportunity to interview, you would have a chance to expand on that. But the essay and the topic that we ask for is there for a reason. So you're really going to want to think about your real estate throughout the application and use the additional information session only in those uh, instances where it is truly warranted. And Many of you might have questions about how you're going to pay for this degree. And my cheeky answer is always, I'm not sure. How are you going to pay for this degree? Um, and so it's something that you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about well ahead of time. Um, my other cheeky response is always that it doesn't get cheaper when you get in. So think about what it means to consider the tuition for any program that you're looking into, what the components of what a tuition or sticker price actually includes. Ours, for instance, is completely and utterly all-inclusive. Other schools may parse out tuition from uh, housing, from room and board, from program fees and materials. So something to think a little bit about. And then again, like I said, the next question is, well, how am I going to pay for this? Uh, most of our students are self-funding this degree. If you've done any research into EMBA programs in general, what you have found out is that there are not an abundance or there is not an abundance of free money out there for executive MBA students or programs. Uh, really the general thinking is you're working, you're not giving up your salary for two years like a traditional full-time MBA student might have to do. Uh, so you are continuing to collect a salary and you will use that in, uh, money and savings and whatever else you might have at your disposal to pay for your education. So scholarships and fellowships in general in EMBA programs do tend to be either non-existent or quite limited. And I would put us in the pool of the latter. Our limited and partial scholarships are offered uh, for anybody who is interested in being considered for the scholarship. When we do offer that opportunity up, we take two things into consideration. One of those is financial need, and it's not necessarily your interpretation of your financial need, but instead using the FAFSA form, which it may have been a while since you filled one of those out, do know that it is online, it is fairly quick, and is much easier than you might remember if you had to do a FAFSA back in your undergrad days. And so the government then sort of spits out a number that estimates your family's contribution towards your own education. Whether or not you agree with that um, might not be uh, might not quite be what you were hoping for or expecting, but it is a uh, part of what we use along with any information that you want to uh, offer up to the committee about what a financial scholarship might be, uh, how that might uh, be meaningful for you. We also, of course, take into account how unique your perspective and the cohort will be and uh, general merit. Uh, what are you going to sort of add to the discussion, to the class, to the cohort? So those are things that we think about. There is an opportunity to be considered for fellowship within the application itself. So if you do intend to ask the committee to please uh, consider you for a scholarship, you will wanna check that box. 
and answer the short corresponding essay within the application itself. We do have a few very special scholarship opportunities. And this photo here is a picture of a moderator and three students at a panel of peers discussion. A panel of peers is an opportunity for students to come together weekly and talk a little bit about what's special and unique for them. This particular panel of peers is students who are fellows for the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship, which is specific for healthcare leaders working on issues of health equity. Uh, and if that's you and that's of interest to you, I highly encourage you to get in touch with us, go to our website, check out the program. Um, but you know, the, the gist of things here is that fellowships are quite unique and specific. Scholarships are open to everybody, but we do take a couple of things into account when considering scholarships and fellowships, but now is the time to start thinking about how you might finance your degree should you be admitted to any program. And always keep in mind, of course, that tuition does tend to go up from year to year. My experience so far in my also many years of doing MBA admissions and MBA admissions, I haven't seen it gone down. Happy to answer questions about that if you have them. Uh, with our last few minutes here, I'd like to just uh, put, um, put out there some next steps. If you haven't already completed a pre-assessment with us, go ahead and hop on our website and do that. Our staff will give you some feedback uh, about your fit for the program, your eligibility for the program as well. Uh, you will want to attend any additional upcoming events that we have. At this time, those are all virtual and they are all listed on our website. Do feel free to reach out to us at emba.admissions at, emba .admissions at yale.edu uh, with any questions that we're either unable to get to today or other questions that you might have. And just as a reminder that we do have a round two deadline coming up on January 31st. If you are interested in being considered for the July incoming cohort, your last two opportunities are number one, round two, number two, round three, um, back in, in March. This is our team. You've met most of us today. Uh, our assistant dean, Wendy Sung, also oversees the program team, and that's a group of staff who will work very hard to make sure that your uh, program goes well at each, uh, uh, every other weekend format goes well. I take care of things like accommodations and food uh, and materials and things like that. But that's a little small, but mighty and the team. Okay, with the time that we have remaining, we do see that you put some great questions in the Q&A. So um, Christine, do you see anything in there that you'd like me to tackle first? And then I'll take a look as well and ask you to help out. And do we have until 12.45 or to one o'clock? A really good question. Okay. <laughs> in any case, let's, let's 12, uh, 12, 12, 45. 45 is what so we'll we'll go over a couple of minutes uh, in the interest of time. If you have to split and head out to your next meeting, um, you know, no problem. We'll record the session and send you the recording when it's over. But for now, let's tackle a few questions and go over a couple of minutes. So Joanne, I am probably going to throw to you the question about um, it's sort of the timing of your application, right? So application sure. will be ready by round two, aiming for round three, I'm worried that applying round three might affect my chances. You know, how do you address that? And we always encourage people to apply when they are most ready. And so if it feels like round two, you've got everything together uh, and you are ready to hit the button, don't second guess yourself, you know, go ahead and, and hit submit and apply when you are most ready. Uh, the advantage being that of course you find out sooner. If however, you're coming to, you know, your uh, application on the 30th of January and feel like it might be a challenge to appropriately represent yourself in the best possible way uh, by the deadline, which is just going to be a day later, then you should probably hold and submit a really thorough, wonderful, um, well done application by the deadline the following round, which would be round three. So always best to apply when you are most ready to do so. Don't worry about whether or not that's going to mess up your chances of being considered for admission for that. Uh, that said, certainly by round three, things can get interesting. And from year to year, that can change depending on the competition for spots in the class in that particular year. So that's a really tough thing to answer. But my, my answer is apply when you are most ready. And the earlier, the better. However, if round three is your round, great. We look forward to reading your application at that time. Um, I'll dive in and sort of grab yeah. one question that's here and just kind of give a little context. Somebody asked, what's the youngest student we've ever had at Yale? We don't really track that information, um, but I will tell you sort of along the lines of that, we do require a minimum of seven years of work experience to be considered. As Joanne mentioned earlier, this is a program that is for managers levels who are kind of in the mid part of their career moving along a trajectory. So youth is not really on your side um, in this uh, part of the equation unless you've suddenly ratcheted up to a high level of leadership. But again, it must be at least seven years of work experience to kind of come <laughs> along that. And I think somebody asked earlier about um, minimum test scores and you know average GPAs. We don't we don't average out the GPAs of our students to figure out what our average GPA is, um, mostly because we have so many people coming from different 
uh, systems. But, um, and in terms of a minimum test score, we don't have one. We do, however, say if you're going to take the executive assessment, you want to be at the 150 mark or north of that, um, tens in each of the three sections. Uh, that is probably, we have more information about that because that is the exam that most of our students will take. Um, though certainly we've had people taking the GMAT and the GRE. The, mm -hmm. the big piece of that is understanding your academic readiness. And in particular, which I didn't mention earlier, that quantitative re re readiness to handle the rigor of the program. So if you're looking at the balance of those two areas, we want to see you in, you know, the 70th percentile or so or above if, if possible to, to see how you're doing. Yeah. Um, Christine, I know we're going over time, but um, yeah. there's a couple of really good questions here. So I'm going to keep continue on just for a couple more minutes. Somebody's asking about employer sponsorship. You know, does that reflect positively on somebody's application uh, if they take advantage of anything that their employer has to offer or would that in any way, um, you know, be a negative in an application? And just so you know, Christine, you are mute. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, just, I tried to click it off and I missed. Um, so uh, while it's nice to see that you have sponsorship and is incredibly exciting news for you to not have to take on the financial burden, it's not something we consider as a criteria for admission. We certainly have had students that come sponsored. It's not terribly common. Uh, the majority of our class, uh, the two classes right now are not sponsored. So it's not part of the evaluation process to kind of put a short answer to it. Um, and someone else put, I, I read if uh, you have an MBA, should you apply? Uh, should you not apply? What if? What about uh, if you have an executive education certificate? So there are plenty of executive education courses you can take both at Yale and other places. Those aren't the same as getting a complete degree. They're content specific to a particular thing you want to be learning and those are fine. But yes, if you've already done an MBA, we really don't encourage you to apply. Um, certainly we don't stop anyone from applying, but at the same time, there would be so much repetition of the content that you would do, particularly because our program is specific to, um, you know, having a lot, a bit more of a lockstep curriculum in that integrated core curriculum, that it would very much overlap what you might have already taken. Yeah, great. Um, I just see a question here about reapplying. If you are not admitted to one round, uh, you know, maybe round three and you're not accepted, you know, how does that really impact your application for a future year? We absolutely encourage people to reapply if it doesn't work out. Um, and if uh, you could just do a really critical self-analysis on why maybe it didn't work out for you, you know, don't blame it on round three. It might just be that your application really wasn't the best it could possibly be. You wanted to try to make sure you got in for that cohort and you submitted something that, you know, upon further reflection was not necessarily the best uh, reflection of who you are as a candidate. So we definitely encourage reapplications, um, but with a critical, critical self-awareness and eye toward how you would want to improve potentially a future application. So that's a really good question, but uh, yeah, we, we do certainly welcome reapplicants. Um, Christine, I think we're about out of time. Do you see anything in last minute that you'd like to tackle no. or um, otherwise somebody, we'll encourage right? folks to- I think somebody media. might be in fact answering one of the last questions Great. there. Okay, we'll give her another uh, chance so, to do that. Um, we appreciate that. Yeah, so um, we'll and give then, you our last tips. Yeah, right. I, have, I have one that I, I give to everybody, which is about timing. You've addressed this a little bit, Christine, you're on your own um, with respect to the letters of recommendation because that can be so time consuming. And I think people really just don't in general uh, give themselves enough time to get through the things that are either time consuming or that they perceive to not be so time consuming. So when it comes to letters of recommendation, get in front of those people sooner than later, start prepping the opportunity to um, take in the EA, you know, the EA, the GMAT, the GRE, don't wake up and decide you're going to take the EA the next day, take it seriously, take the time uh, that it's required to at least prep for it. I've had people say, well, I took it cold. So of course my score wasn't good. We don't recommend that. <laughs> um, don't take it just to take it, take it with some preparation and thought toward it. Um, some of these things can really be a proxy for how we imagine you might show up as an MBA student in the program. So we really do encourage you to think about timing. Timing is everything and it can it can be deceptive about how much time you think you have for something versus how much time it actually takes. So pretend the application deadline is a couple of days before it is, give yourself those last couple of days to go over everything with a fine tooth comb. And, and when you hit submit, feel really good about that. Christine, what's your best advice? Uh, my best advice is to do your research. I mentioned this when we were going through, but really do your research. Don't just rely on your area of focus as being the fit for the Yale EMBA. That certainly makes sense for most people, but we, you know, we're more than just those six classes you'll end up taking. So we want to, we want to get to know you a bit more and understand how you fit with our culture, with our mission, with our community, all of those things. So really, really spend the time to get to know us. We have tons, as Joanne mentioned earlier, of previously recorded webinars. Um, you can reach out to us anytime at emba.admissions at yale.edu. Um, and I know there were some questions we weren't able to answer. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to contact us anytime and we can either uh, 
chat via email, um, or we're happy to arrange a call if that's what it, what it needs to answer a very specific question. But we appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, Joanne, for being my partner in crime today. Always. Yeah, um, always happy to do that. Thanks so much for everybody for being here today. Thanks to Christine, David, and Liz on our team as well. We hope everybody is stay safe, stays healthy. We look forward to seeing you in some future events as well, and perhaps in the building as a future member of the class of 2024 or beyond. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. We wish you all the best. And Christine, see you later. See you later. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.